One morning, I arrived at my office. This was when I served with another UU congregation elsewhere. As I was putting my bag down, the administrator stopped at the door and said, Mark called and wants to speak with you. I asked the administrator to call him back and set it up for the next day. Mark arrived that next day. He was still wearing his work clothes, the insignia of a local university on his pocket. He told me he was retiring in two weeks after 20 years of his work on the grounds with the university. I held up my hands in the air and said, that's fantastic, I'm so happy for you. That's wonderful. He didn't smile. He only nodded and sat down. The next words out of his mouth were, when I first started working at the university, I used chemicals, the ones they gave me to put on the lawn. I thought nothing of it. It was long ago. Nowadays, I know the chemicals are harmful. I can't shake the idea, he said, that all these years have gone by and I have been putting dangerous weed killer on the grounds. I'm so ashamed. I've been poisoning the earth all this time. He buried his face in his hands and then he balled up his fists and hit his knees with them. I said, Mark, when you first started working, you didn't know this. He quickly said, yes, but a few years ago, I learned otherwise and told my supervisor that it was bad. He and the university refused to adopt changes. And here I am, part of a system that is destroying the earth. He shook his head. I said, Mark, I see that this has been a terrible, ethical, awful struggle for you. You have done what you could. Had you been more adamant, you likely would have lost your job, and then you would have lost your home, those grounds that you cherish at your home, the ones, the grounds, the house that you care for with your wife. You have been a part of this fellowship. You're on the board. You have been teaching us better ways of taking care of our grounds here. All of these actions have been a great fit for you. Mark said, working the grounds, that's the only thing I know how to do. And over the years, I've learned how to grow organic vegetables, how to do lawn care without chemicals. And I know the importance of installing native plants in residential and commercial landscapes. However, I wish I'd been more forceful at my job but I know for a fact they would have fired me, and then I would not have been able to feed myself or my family. Mike hung his head, and we sat in silence. Once again, I tried to speak of words of comfort. I said, Mark, you are retiring in two weeks. Please be kind to yourself. Give yourself permission to celebrate. Celebrate the many years of your commitment to hard work. Please don't hold on to this guilt and shame. I understand you're interested in Buddhism. Maybe you recall, Mark, that in this spoke of the wheel, the eightfold path, one of them says right livelihood or skilled livelihood. It speaks to being able to live in a way that fits with your interests and your passions. But get this, Buddhism is a practice. Life is complex and demands consideration in multiple areas. We are never going to be able to get everything absolutely, completely correct at any time. The best we can do is to pause, to reflect, to be gentle with ourselves and others while moving in a direction of a life filled with more ease, more peace, and meaning. In two weeks, Mark, you'll be able to live that right livelihood more fully, and then perhaps you'll have more time to spend sharing your knowledge with people in the community, people here in the fellowship. You will have an influence. You have had an influence. 
please don't give up. He slowly stood, said thank you, and left. Mark did retire. However, just three weeks later, he died of what was likely an alcohol-induced heart attack. They found him on his knees, hunched over the coffee table with his head on his fists. This wonderful, knowledgeable, kind, 65-year-old man who with his words and actions had done so much good on so many occasions had, in my eyes, died of intense despair. Alice Walker wrote, I have learned to accept the fact that we risk disappointment, dis disillusionment, even despair every time we act. Every time we decide to believe the world can be better. For every time we decide to trust others to be as noble as we think they are. And that there might be years during which our, act, our grief is equal to or even greater than our hope. I'm here for that. She said the alternative, however, is not to act, not to reflect, therefore to miss experiencing other people at their best, reaching toward their fullness. That's never appealed to me not to act, not to be with people who are struggling and trying. I am so grateful to have known Mark. And yet I've got to say this. Mark and his wife were friends with another couple who were members of that fellowship. These two, I loved them, but oh, it was so hard. The judgmental words that came out of their mouths was so difficult, so difficult. There was constant criticizing much of everything anybody did. Nothing was ever good enough. If the community didn't adopt policies that they personally wanted, they were loud, demeaning, and demanding. There was no we in the participation. In fact, they left for numerous reasons, including a workday when Windex was used on the windows. And some of the other things was our potlucks weren't quite vegan enough. I wondered what it must have been like to be Mark with that inner turmoil, to have had such a close relationship with individuals who were so judgmental. I wonder how many of us know the weight of harsh, condescending words. I don't want to judge others either. I'm just self-aware enough to know that I, too, have growing edges. So I understand this desire to want to hurry up and make immediate change for what is important to me personally. In a congregation of many hearts and minds, one where we have a promise, a covenant, if you will, to speak with one another with kindness, and we agree to take the time to talk and to listen in order to find common ground rather than speaking over one another with our personal demands. Here in this Unitarian Universalist community, as we continue to fully reopen and as we work toward a developmental goal such as become, going from an I congregation where we, everybody has to do what we personally want, we become a we congregation where we work to make solutions together. Is there any hope for a group of people with so many differing perspectives and desires to move in the direction of a developmental goal where we become more of a we community. I know many of us would rather be transported. Let's change and make it happen now, right? Transported, do you remember Star Trek, right? The characters were always being transported. That is their physical matter changed into energy. And they could leave one place and reemerge in another place with their bodies still intact. I know it was fictional, 
But that had to be a jarring experience. Nobody ever jumped. I was always waiting to watch somebody standing there and there's a person who materializes. Nobody jumped. And then when you materialized into another place, nobody jumped and said, whoa, the surroundings are different. I jump when the phone rings. <laughs> so, you know, it's a lot to expect change to happen right now, immediate change. So expecting the new UUC future to suddenly materialize is unreasonable. Some would like it to immediately appear. Look, in so many ways, life will never be like it was in the past. For example, our Sunday services will remain a hybrid sort of service. We will have people present here and on Zoom. That's the new reality. This wasn't happening before stupid COVID, and I can't say stupid COVID without saying stupid. Those were awful days. So maybe as we envision how to move forward toward a different future, we should consider the collective journey to be more like rising up a ladder rather than teleporting quickly. Okay, I'm gonna, going to divulge something about myself. Speaking of ladders, I am obsessed with ladders. Unlike what some of you might think, well, of course she is. Look at how... That's not it. That's not it. No. My love affair with ladders began when I saw a piece by Georgia O'Keeffe, a painting by Georgia O'Keeffe. It's titled Ladder to the Moon. It hangs at the Whitney Museum of Modern Art in New York City. In the piece, there is a ladder suspended in a blue sky. You can see the moon over here. That ladder's not touching the moon. It's not there yet. And it's also not on the ground. So the, you see the ground, the sky, the ladder, and the moon. I was enchanted by it. It's metaphorical in so many ways. And then here's the thing. I also came across several ladder images in paintings by Jacob Lawrence, including one titled The Builders. Lawrence painted the first one in 1947. O'Keeffe's piece was in 1958. Jacob Lawrence said he painted it representing all the people who had moved north to build better lives during the Great Migration from 1910 to 1970, when nearly 6 million African Americans moved from the south to the north because of poor economic conditions, racial segregation, and those wretched Jim Crow laws. The painting was purchased and delivered to the White House to the White House Historical Association in 2008, just shortly before Obama arrived. Now, because of copyright issues, I can't share these paintings with you this morning. You can look them up later. I hope you too will enjoy them and pause to consider metaphors when you look at these pieces. It was about 10 years ago when I began to see a ladder as a symbol for ascendance, for hope, for love, for justice, that is forever present. It's there, but we often overlook it. I believe a ladder is a symbol for humanity's ability to rise from current circumstances to something better. Here's the thing about ladders that you might not have thought about. They show up all around us, but we often don't see them because we aren't looking for them. If we aren't watching for signs of hope, I mean ladders, we will miss them entirely. For example, on your drive home today, maybe as you drive around later this week, look around. Look around. You will likely observe a ladder on the top of a truck, another one leaning against a house. Might even see one sticking out of somebody's back window like I saw yesterday. Sticking sideways, not even back, sideways. When you begin to look around, you'll see them everywhere. It's astounding, really. So here's another thing. If you see one ladder, you're going to see another one. It happens. 
If not on the same truck where the one ladder was, you're going to see another truck that passes you or you go past. Now, this is not a scientific fact. It's only anecdotal evidence. And as much as I love chocolate, as sure as I love chocolate, I'm here to tell you ladders happen, and it's often two at a time. Check my words this week. In the beginning, I kept this secret obsession to myself. However, after a little while, I couldn't keep quiet about it. So much to my spouse's surprise, everywhere we went, I began yelling, ladder, ladder. <laughs> it was quite jolting in the beginning. But now we can be traveling and having a conversation in the car, going about our way, and I'll, I'll see two, and I'll, ladder, ladder. And we keep having a conversation. Nobody stops anymore. He is accommodating my childish, maybe insightful ways, maybe, but not so much in the beginning. Listen, together, you and I can work toward adopting better ways, both at home. Does it have to be your way? Can it be the other people in your family, their way too? You and I can get caught up in our individual wants, needs, and demands that we will forget to pause to acknowledge solutions provided by others, to even notice that we are a party of we, not I, and that we are all working toward best practices for a better future. That is, a future post-COVID, for better, for worse, that will be nothing like the past ever again. Acknowledging that we are a community of individuals, each of us with different expectations and passions, may we slow down, slow down and become less demanding, less demanding of each other. I know we are a society of hurry up and get to the airport and wait. Hurry up, go down the highway, stop the stop line and wait. Hurry up, bake the cookies and wait. But I don't think this hurry up stuff is healthy for us, do you? Perhaps going forward in all things, might it be a better mantra to repeat? Steady we go, then pause. Steady we go, then pause. Steady we go, then pause. My fear is that each of us will focus on our own personal expectations and that they will become so intense that we will begin to lose ourselves, our health, our friends, and our collective movement forward. And I will admit, in many ways, I too have personal visions that I want UUC to pursue right away. But working with that ladder imagery, I realize there is no rushing up the rungs. Anyone try moving up a ladder too quickly? It's dangerous. One risk losing total balance. And if you are working on a project with others, move too fast, and soon you'll notice that no one is climbing with you. So here's an example of my learning edge. After working together for four months now, you all likely have a clue about my passion for environmentalism, which is linked to other justice issues. So we have begun to welcome more potlucks. Some of you know that I have advocated for bringing plates and flatware from home to avoid landfill and avoid using the kitchen. Therefore, recently, when this lovely, beautiful announcement came across my email to share about Christmas Eve service, about a Christmas Day brunch, about a festival of the lights activity next Sunday, about a winter solstice labyrinth walk, I said, well, didn't you put anything in there about bring your dishes from home, your flatware and your plates? And then I stopped. And I said, wait a minute. This is my agenda. Now, you all in my contract and my letter of agreement said, okay, Rev. Amy, you have a Sunday morning. That's your realm. You get to decide. There was nothing in my letter of agreement about kitchen management. I recall. <laughs> so, you did, though, invite me here as a UU minister to remind you, are you behaving the way you say you want to behave, that you are representing a Unitarian Universalist community 
in our many decisions, are we being true to what we say we are, our Unitarian Universalist values, especially the principles, the seventh principle and the eighth one. And yet, what is also true is that we agreed in a process of shared ministry to the work we endeavor together. These are areas where we work together, and there are areas where you have defined my role and areas where we definitely work together, and that's one of them. When I realized that, oh my gosh, I have become the evil eye, the messy one, the messy must be my way or no way brat. I called myself a brat. Don't you call me a brat. <laughs> All right, so I immediately sent an email and said, Mia culpa, I've muddied the waters. That's a lovely announcement. Send it out. Leave, it, leave off my sentence. Because I realized that if I can't live what I'm preaching about those developmental goals, we are aiming to be a we congregation that we will work together to make solutions. Then nobody else is going to say, oops, oops. Together with environmental justice team, we will work on moves to get closer to our goals regarding the kitchen, but it will be slow and it will be a deliberate process. Perhaps change in healthy congregational life should be more like moving carefully up a ladder, gradually, one rung at a time, pausing on occasion to look around and evaluate the next step. And rather than yelling, go faster or you're doing it wrong, may we speak to one another with more kindness. Maybe we'll hold the ladder. Maybe we'll be the ones climbing it. But most of all, may we all say, look, let's listen to each other and figure out how to create solutions together. Rung by rung, we will move closer to where we want to be with kitchen policies, with the choir, with the lifespan religious education program, with social justice, with pastoral care, with grounds, and so much more. And if we fail to be our better selves, if we lose our patience with others, I hope we'll all pause to say, oops, I lost my footing. I'm sorry. Might we try again? Might we try again? May it be so. May it be so.